Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, episode 230. Episode 230. Even though in my notes it says 229. It is 230. Unfinished Tales, part one. Greta, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Doing pretty well. Awesome. Doing pretty snazzy. Yeah. Snazzerific. It's exciting to be kind of moving on to a different project. Yeah. A different focus, maybe. I agree with that. Yeah. Yep. Because I know we've read some stuff out of here, but I'm looking forward to learning more, reading more. I'm looking forward to learning more about all of these post-Silmarillion works, because mm-hmm. this is really, as we announced on the last episode, that's our focus for the foreseeable future, is post-Silmarillion uh, works of Middle Earth. So we're going to be looking at Unfinished Tales and then the History of Middle Earth, which is like 12 books. So, um, and if you want to know exactly what our plan is there, uh, go back and listen to episode 229 if you haven't already. So, yes. All right. Yeah, cool. so like I said, on this episode, we are beginning our journey through the post Silmarillion landscape by taking a high level look at Unfinished Tales. I plan for this overview of Unfinished Tales to cover this episode as well as the next one. We also have a lot of great correspondence to get to, so make sure and stick around to the end of the show when we're going to try and hit some of it. Oh, yeah, we haven't done that in a while, have we? No, we have not. Yeah, we've been, uh, so. the correspondence was really piling up, so. That's good. It, it is good, but I, I also uh, I also feel bad with everyone that I'm not able to respond to immediately. Sometimes, the, you know, it's like seasonal with me. Like sometimes I'm really good about responding immediately and mm-hmm. sometimes it just piles up and it's just been a busy last uh, several weeks. Yeah. So it's been hard. New Year always tends to be that way, I yeah. think. Yeah, and you get off to a good start in the new year and then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you're kind of making way and then that's, that's generally like early January, it's like, boom, off to that start off to that start then late january you start getting like things start getting thrown at you from other people and you get bogged down and you get into Mm -hmm. february and it's like you know it's kind of it's kind of the dark ages it is (laughs) it's kind of like the like there's a thing um i think all of you know that that we homeschool our children but there's actually like this thing especially among homeschool families i think it's called like the february blues or Mm -hmm. something and like it's almost like you you got to kind of brace yourself for it because it's coming no matter what. And it's the time that most people just throw in the towel or just quit or whatever. So Fe- February is just a hard month, like regardless, I think. I think a big part of it is there's no sports. I'll be honest. Well, well yeah. No sports that we watch. Well, after the Super Bowl ended, yeah. Um, yes. Well, that was very early February. Yeah, and the Super Bowl sucked this year. It did Man. suck. Um well, no, sorry, Tom Brady fans. I'm sure you all loved it. Well, even then, like it was like even if you love Tom Brady, it's like it was just a, not a good game. It wasn't a good you know, game. It was really like oh, this. This is over early. Yeah. Um, At least there were some decent commercials, but we probably shouldn't get too far down that rabbit trail. I didn't see any decent commercials anyway. Uh, I liked a few of them. Well, yeah. Anyway, who cares about any of that? We have Tolkien to talk about. I got way off track there. I apologize. All good. February sucks. We get it. February does suck. All right. Before we get started, we'd like to give a shout out to our patrons. Special thanks to this episode's executive producers, Caitlin of Tea with Tolkien, Lise Yu, Andrew T, and John R. Thanks, guys. Thank you all so much for your um, your amazing patronage. Mm-hmm. We'll give a shout out to our newest patrons as well, Sarah W. and Donald M. Thank you all oh, so much. Oh, yes. Thank you. And and uh, and and as well to our rec- most recent annualized uh, pleasures, Robert S. and uh, and Tylen M. Woo! So nice. Yes. Thanks, guys. Yes, indeed. All yeah. of our patrons are amazing. You you all of you are amazing, and um, you know just a virtual virtual high five to all of our patrons again, right? Whoosh, right. So they get to see that because they've got the video. <laughs> That's right. So I wonder how that looked. Probably a little awkward, but we tried. It looked awesome. Did That's it look how awesome? It looked. Yeah. Okay. I'll take Would, your word for it. Wouldn't you want to get a virtual high five from uh, your yeah. favorite podcast? Absolutely. Heck, heck Absolutely. Yes. Especially if it looked cool. Yeah. Yeah. Which ours did. It, according totally. According to you. We can't. We're not capable of looking not cool. Okay. Or wait, we are. Wait. We we're, are we're not capable, not capable of, of looking not uncool. Cap- we're not capable of looking not cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there. that's right. That works. Okay. Double Almost negative. got myself into a little Bilboism there. All right. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you too can become a patron of the Tolkien Road by visiting patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Becoming a patron lets you support the show in a tangible way and lands you some awesome perks like video recordings of our episodes. 
Check it out now to learn more about all of the exciting perks we offer. Don't forget, you can now make an annual pledge and get one month free. It's a good deal. Free. Not much is free in this life, peeps. That's right. Take it. So, take what you can get. So capitalize. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can also support the Tolkien Road by leaving us a one-time tip. Just look in the show notes on your podcatcher for the leave a tip link, or head on over to TolkienRoad.com and look for a blue le- look for the blue leave a tip button. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you find us. So if that's iTunes, definitely do it there. Subscribe, rate, and review. Uh, if it's on some other podcasting platform, then do it over there as well. That helps get the word out about the Tolkien Road. It's a super easy way to support the show. Word. And uh, and and YouTube, right? YouTube is the latest thing, so we're getting up there. I think we are almost to 500 subscribers on YouTube, really? which is uh, which is cool. That feels like kind of a milestone. Yes. Uh, but you know, I want to. I'm I'm going for 500 million, right? So don't hold we back. Got some, we got some work to do, people. Go big or go home. All you got to do is go over to YouTube, click that subscribe button, and hey, by the way, click the bell next to it too, because that that makes sure you get notified when we re- when we release new stuff mm, over there. That's how it works. Yeah. Okay. Simple so, enough. Uh, just go to TolkienRoad.com slash YouTube and it'll forward you to the to our YouTube channel. Yeah. So all right, not much in the world of Tolkien News. Stick around for correspondence till the very end. Our Tolkien quote of the week. This is a good one. All right, this is from Fairy Stories again. I say again because we've done several quotes from on Fairy Stories recently. Fantasy can, of course, be carried to excess. It can be ill done. It can be put to evil uses. It may even delude the minds out of which it came. But of what human thing in this fallen world is that not true? Men have conceived not only of elves, but they have imagined gods and worshipped them, even worshipped the, the, those most deformed by their author's own evil. But they have made false gods out of other materials, their nations, their banners, their monies. Even their sciences and their social and economic theories have demanded human sacrifice. Abusus non tolit usum. Fantasy remains a human right. We make in our in our measure and in our derivative mode because we are made. And not only made, but made in the image and likeness of a maker. Oh. Yeah. That's great. That is a really great mm-hmm. quote. Um, you know, our minds are capable of, you know, making anything into a bad thing. That doesn't necessarily mean that um that you know, because fantasy has led people to making up bad things, that it's a bad thing. It's actually right. a very good thing. It's from yeah. a long part uh and on fairy stories, of course, the whole thing is really about defending, you know, defending and explaining the reason for fantasy and literature. Right. Uh, but that Latin phrase, ab- abusus non tolit usum, and I'm, my, my Latin pronunciation is very bad. But uh, what that means is the abuse does uh, the abuse doesn't negate the proper use. Right. Uh, or when I Googled it, it says the abuse doesn't take away from the use. Right. Mm, so yeah. just because something can be abused doesn't mean that that necessarily negates the use of it the general. use of it in yeah. the right way in the right way right exactly which is a uh, a good little corrective maxim for a lot of things you know it can be applied to many many things absolutely I think. absolutely yeah. so it's just kind of letting one bad experience ruin ruining all future ones for you like right. there's no reason for that yeah uh yes exactly exactly so great wisdom from tolkien mm-hmm. there good stuff always 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 all right, Greta, let's talk about Unfinished Tales, yeah, shall we? let's do it. Let's do it. So on this episode, we're getting back to an exploration of Tolkien's works and Legendarium resuming with Unfinished Tales, or as it's properly named, Unfinished Tales of Numenor and Middle-earth. We've actually covered a number of the chapters from Unfinished Tales on past episodes, and we will link to those in the show notes just to let you know what we've covered. Um, we've covered uh, of the Astari, of the Palantiri, We've done the Mariner's Wife. Done the Mariner's Wife. We did four episodes on the Mariner's mm-hmm. Wife. That um, was good. Yeah, and we've done the um, we've done the. I'm gonna get the name wrong because I don't have my table of contents pulled up. Here we go. Give me one moment to pull up my table of contents. Here we go. We've done the Disaster of the Gladden Fields, the Quest mm-hmm. of Erebor, and and I think that's it. I think we so we've done the Istari, the Palantiri, the Disaster of the Gladden Fields, the Quest of Erebor. And Aldarion and Arendis, the Mariner's, Mariner's wife, wife yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, there's maybe not quite half of it, you know, but we've done a, a good chunk of it because there's a lot of stuff that you're in there. And it's like, ooh, I want to know more about the wizards, mm-hmm. right? Everybody Who wants to know more about the wizards. Yeah. Um, so we have done those on past episodes, and I'll link to those in the show notes so that you can access them more easily. Cool. 
Um, but yeah, so we've done a good bit of this, but I wanted to just take a look at the overall work because we didn't start out by proceeding through it systematically. And it'll be, I think, I think this was a truly pivotal work in, uh, in the in the history of Tolkien's publications, right? Mm. It's amazing to think that Tolkien, for as famous an author as he is, basically published two major works in his lifetime, right? Now he published a lot of other stuff, but but in terms of like the things that he's really famous for, two works. That's that's incredible. That's kind of mind blowing. <laughs> it is. Um, I mean, I I can't think of many many really really famous authors who that's who that's true for or authors as famous as Tolkien. Right. Yeah. Um, I th- like one that sprung immediately to mind is somebody like JD Salinger who did mm-hmm. Ket- who's famous for catcher in the rye. Um, he had like three other works, I think published three other major works published in his, uh, in his lifetime. Of course he was an interesting figure because he just kind of, he became famous for catcher in the rye and a few other works and then just decided to stop publishing. He kept writing, but decided to stop publishing. So he's a very idiosyncratic figure in that way. Um, but I can't think of anybody off the top of my head who could say like the only two works published in their life. So the mantle of publishing after he passed away, he left all these writings and the mantle fell to Christopher, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's that's where we pick up, right? So Tolkien left all of this unfinished stuff. And um, and then in 1977, so, he, so Tolkien dies in 1973. Then in 1977, Christopher publishes The Silmarillion. Right, which mm-hmm. we've done. We we started mm-hmm. out doing the Silmarillion on this mm-hmm. podcast. Went through every chapter, and the Silmarillion. It's funny because I look back on it now, and I'm like, you know, I used to think the Silmarillion was like so difficult and everything, and it, and and it is if you've never read it before. But once you've gotten through it a few times and you're pretty familiar with the Legendarium, it's no longer very difficult. But then you look at like unfinished tales in the history of Middle Earth, and you're like, those are really difficult yeah. to get into, right? Um, I'm, I know there is a lot of good stuff in those because we've looked at some of it with unfinished tales, mm-hmm. but it's, there is a, um, it, it's, you know, it's like, Lord, it's like the Hobbit, the Hobbit's on one level. And then the Lord of the Rings is a step up in difficulty. And then the Silmarillion is another step up in difficulty. And then unfinished tales and history of Middle Earth, like, like just skyrocket, right? Yeah. They're almost academic works, right? Yes. Yes. And, you know, just reading the introduction, like even just part of the introduction for in preparation for this episode, I was like, whoa. Yeah. Like, what are we getting into? <laughs> I mean, just the introduction itself, I was like a little lost. Well, you remember reading through any of those chapters that we've done already that it, they're not written in like, it's not like you just read this chapter and it's like one story, right? Mm-hmm. It is, it, it'll it'll have part of it and then Christopher will interject. Yeah, he has like the right? notes and stuff, yeah. And, and he'll explain like, okay, this is where one manuscript leaves off and this is where this other manuscript picks up. There's a few differences from, uh, you know, in in the details of that first part of the manuscript between manuscripts A and B. Mm-hmm. And that's why I've chosen to use C. And you're just, you start getting kind of confused at that point unless you're really like doing the math and writing things down. Right. So, no, um, the Marin- I don't remember the Mariner's Wife being like that. Well, it, 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 it may not have been that extreme, but there's definitely, like, he definitely interjects and there's, like, my father, ne- like, he never finished um, The Mariner's Wife, right? Like, yes, I see what you're Everything yes. in here is unfinished. Yeah. Yeah, right? I see what you're saying. There are things that yeah. Tolkin wrote some portion of yeah. and never completely and finished And some more than lifetime. others. Like, some are more finished mm-hmm. than others. But the original unfinished work was The Silmarillion, mm-hmm. right? Tolkien mm-hmm. never finished The Silmarillion in his lifetime. Yeah. So it can be a little deceptive when we arrive at the Silmarillion and we read the Silmarillion and we just, we see it as this finished thing. And we think like, Oh, well that's how Tolkien left it to us. Christopher just kind of published what his father left. And it's like, no, the actual truth is that there, they had, he had to do a lot of work. And so we go back to the Silmarillion, which was published in 1977 to start off on our understanding of unfinished tales. Unfinished Tales was published in 1980 and, at least in retrospect, serves as something of a pilot for the ambitious multi-volume History of Middle-Earth series that was to follow. It was the second major work of the Middle-Earth legendarium to be published after Tolkien's death, with the first being The Silmarillion in 1977. It was also the second major work to bear Tolkien's name, but with editorial credit being given to Christopher Tolkien, his youngest son. In this work, Christopher fully embraces the editorial role serving as a narrative tour guide through the various writings compiled therein. So it's like, this is kind of like a museum of his father's work, Mm -hmm. of his father's unfinished writings. Mm -hmm. And he's the tour guide through it, right? 
That makes sense. Yeah. Therefore, while it's a hugely valuable work, it's also an even more challenging read than the Silmarillion because the flow of the text is frequently interrupted by Tolkien's or by Christopher's editorial interjections. So it's a different approach than the Silmarillion was to what Tolkien left us. Um, and, you know, part of what I want to try to strive to begin understanding is why Christopher did it this way, because he, he not only did it here, but he continued doing this for the rest of his lifetime, right? When he published his father's works, right? Yeah. His father's legendarium. He took this kind of approach. And so why was that? We, we must understand that Christopher found himself stuck between a rock and a hard place. These are, after all, unfinished tales, or in other words, stories not finalized by his father. Christopher chose a deliberate path that he would stick with for the rest of his life, not the road of conjecturing the mind of his father or of picking up his mantle, but the scholarly road of sharing from his father's huge treasury of notes, sketches, timelines, and rough drafts, and doing his best to help us understand how these things developed over time. But He, he wouldn't have had much guidance. I mean, like there was no one else, really. There wasn't like Tolkien had an agent or like some other kind of someone who is really informed of his intentions. So this was like a huge undertaking. Well, I mean, I, I don't know that he didn't have some, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure Tolkien had agents at different times in his life. I don't, you know. Well, maybe I'm, agent's the wrong word, but, but I meant there wasn't someone else that but, was super well, knowledgeable. Christopher was the designated like heir to, you know, to, to his father's work, right? Like mm -hmm. he was, he was the one that was primarily responsible right. for carrying it forward in whatever way it should be carried forward. Sure. Um, yeah. I'm just saying it was a huge undertaking. It, it, oh, absolutely. No doubt. But we have to understand. So we have to understand that with the Silmarillion, which he felt a, a responsibility to publish, right? He, he undertook it in a certain way that it would seem that after it came out, he had his regrets about how it, how it all went down. Mm. Right. And so understanding that by itself can help us understand why he went a different approach for the rest of his life with his father's works. Mm. Right. Let me think about. It. So, let me let me just read this. So that I'm going to um, the Lord of the Rings wiki, uh, Lord of the Rings and I'll try I'll try to remember to link to this. But this is on the Silmarillion page, and it says after Tolkien's death. For several years after his father's death, Christopher Tolkien compiled a similar a Silmarillion narrative, which at the time he felt best approximated his father's intentions. As explained in the history of Middle Earth, Christopher drew upon numerous sources for his narrative relying on post-Lord of the Rings works where possible, but ultimately reaching as far back as the 1917 Book of Lost Tales to fill in portions of the narrative which his father had planned to write but never addressed. On some of the later parts of Quintus Silmarillion, which were in the roughest state, he worked with Guy Gavriel Kay, later a noted fantasy author himself, to construct a narrative practically from scratch. The final result, which included genealogies, maps, an index, and the first ever released Elvish word list, was published in 1977. Due to Christopher's extensive explanations of how he compiled the published work, much of the Silmarillion has been debated by the hardcore fans. Christopher's task is generally accepted as very difficult given the state of his father's text at the time of his death. Some critical texts were no longer in the Tolkien's family possession, and Christopher's task compelled him to rush through much of the material. Christopher reveals in later volumes of the History of Middle-Earth many divergent ideas which do not agree with the published version. Christopher has suggested that, had he taken more time and had access to all the texts, he might have produced a substantially different work, but he was impelled by considerable pressure and demand from his father's readers and publishers to produce something quick, uh, publishable as quickly as possible. Um, it, however, they note, it is a severe misapprehension to think that Christopher wrote the Silmarillion, which, except in his con concluding part, is almost entirely in his father's own words. However, it goes on to note that uh, Guy Gabriel Kay, the previously mentioned fantasy author who assisted Christopher in writing the Silmarillion and compiling the Silmarillion, you know, he he contributed a decent amount of effort to the work as well. So basically we have like Tolkien himself left like the rough the the in some in some he, he left the outline, he left um and in, in many cases he left nearly completed versions of the stories that had developed in many ways over time, right? And then, um, and then he left a few parts where it was like, it wasn't really clear. It was clear this was supposed to be included, but there, there wasn't as much to work with. Right. And they had to fill in some blanks and kind of conjecture some things. Right. Um, so 
So that's how we wound up with the Silmarillion. It wasn't like Tolkien like died and the Silmarillion was all ready to go. It was like Christopher had to do some serious work to get it ready to publish, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or is he deemed ready to publish? Yeah. Um, and it just seems that after looking back on the process, Christopher maybe looked, thought to himself, well, I could continue doing this with my father's work. I can kind of continue going through that process or I can do something else and I can just kind of all this, I can just show the world what my father did over the course of his life, right? Like how these things, how these great stories developed over the course of his life, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so with all that being said, we can see Unfinished Tales as the jumping off point for the entire history of the Middle Earth Project. Mm. So I kind of thought of it this way. You can break it down into three options, all right? Christopher had three options. He could do nothing. You're talking right? about three options as far as Unfinished as, Tales go. As far as everything after the Silmarillion. Everything, right? okay. He could do nothing, mm -hmm. right? Which we're glad he didn't do nothing, yeah. right? Um, number two, he could continue his father's work with new writers or with Guy Gabriel mm -hmm. K or whoever, right? Mm -hmm. um, he could, like, one of the things I posited on the last episode was, you know, in an alter some alternate universe, like, Christopher becomes just the executive producer for Middle Earth and just starts mm -hmm. hiring different people to, like, expand the legendarium and write all these different stories. And he chose not to go down that route. Like, me, I'm like, that could have been kind of cool, but maybe mm -hmm. it's better he didn't, right? And and I think that's one of the things we'll debate back and forth as we go through this whole series. Um, and the third option he had was explore the textual history of the Legendarium, right? Yeah. And that's really the road he ended up going down, starting with Unfinished Tales, right? He wanted to give a more academic, textual history of all of these things, right? To be able to give context to why you know certain story like certain stories would um would re you know repeat but be different right and in, in uh in different settings right so for example you might notice by looking at the table of contents of unfinished tales right that the very first two things from the first age are of tuor and his coming to gondolin and narni narn i hin hurin which is the 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 children of hurin i believe that's the translation of that or the children of Turin, right? Children of Turin. Yeah, children of Turin. That's what it is. And you're like, wait a minute. Both of those are stories from the Silmarillion. So mm. what gives? Why are, why are they here? Right? And it would seem, we'll get into that, but it would seem that Christopher wanted to present these things in a less edited version, right? He wanted to present mm. them as his father really left them, warts and all. Right, because they were pretty heavily edited in the Silmarillion for the for the saying? Silmarillion, right? Okay, especially, and I think we'll see this. Um, the version we have of Tour and his coming to Gondolin. This was like this is actually like the first part of a much longer Fall of Gondolin story, mm. and in the Silmarillion, that chapter is actually pretty short. It's uh, one of the shorter chapters. So this right? is kind of expanded, though. right? Yeah. So you know, so that's that's kind of where where this like the genesis of this right christopher apparently had a change of heart about continuing down what he the road of what he did with the silmarillion and he wanted to he wanted to just give the world the full thing like warts and all of what his father had left mm -hmm. right i think there's something admirable about that i think it is right yeah. and and i think in the long run as fans of tolkien for as much as we'd like to just see like just more just stories just to sit down and read and enjoy I think maybe we'll look back and say like that was a really smart move because it holds everything coming forward to a much higher standard. Right? Yeah, I think you're right about that. Um, yeah, you know, I think it leaves less room for artists to come in and be like, "Well, I am going to tell the story I want to tell." Right? It's be like your story sucks. Stop messing up Tolkien's stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> be true to Legendary. Be true to what he left us. Right. You know, and and that's uh, you know, we're we're all about that. I was that. gonna say that we're starting to sound like a broken record over here. <laughs> well, I'm not I'm not gonna stop with that, right? Yeah, nor, no, nor should you. It. Nor should you. All right, so those are the three options. He chose option three. The book's introduction provides us with Christopher's explanation as to why he has chosen the editorial and scholarly path, as well as an overview of the various works contained therein. Um, let me pull up. I gotta pull it up here on my. Kindle. All right. Intro. There we go. So he starts off. The problems that confront one given responsibility for the writings of a dead author are hard to resolve. Some persons in this position may elect to make no material whatsoever available for publication, save perhaps for work that was in a virtually finished state at the time of the author's death. 
In the case of the unpublished writings of J.R.R. Tolkien, this might seem at first sight the proper course. Since he himself, peculiarly critical and and exacting of his own work, would not have dreamt of allowing even the most completed narratives in this book to appear without much further refinement. So that's another thing. <laughs> Let me just say this about about Christopher's writing. He writes in that kind of like like indirect, circular sort of ac- academic uh, speak, and and it and it's kind of has that air of like the uh, the refined English gentleman as well, mm, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and so it can be a little hard to engage with, right? You really it takes it takes some applying to engage with it. Yeah, um, I do go back and reread. Yeah, I I it. have too, right? Yeah. I I mean I've read that paragraph multiple times now, and I t- I still kind of have to think stop and think about it <laughs> what is he saying? and like glance at my notes. Exactly what is he saying here? <laughs> yeah, <Right>? yeah. <laughs> but he is saying something. He is, he is saying something, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. What he's saying is. Uh, Option one was off the, you know, was, was, he considered it, but it was off the table. Option one being do nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Option two, okay. Um, And uh, I'm sorry, let me go back. Option one was off the table. And that's why he briefly chose option two, right? To just have somebody help him edit it and put out another, you know, just basically put out these works as he thought his father would have wanted them to be put out, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And... And after having done that, he looked at it and he said, mm, I don't think I want to do that anymore. All right. Um, so, you know, that's that's how we wound up with, um, you know, with unfinished tales in this case. On the other hand, the nature, this is going back to the introduction. On the, na- on the other hand, the nature and scope of his invention seems to me to place even his abandoned stories in a peculiar position. That the Silmarillion should remain unknown was for me out of the question, despite its disordered state, and despite my father's known if very largely unfulfilled intentions for its transformation. And in that case, I presumed, after long hesitation, to present the work not in the form of an historical study, a complex of divergent texts interlinked by commentary, but as a complete and cohesive entity. The narratives in this book are indeed on an altogether different footing. Taken, to, taken together, they constitute no whole, and the book is no more than a collection of writings disparate in form, intent, finish, and date of composition, and in my own treatment of them, concerned with Numenor and Middle-earth. But the argument for their publication is not different in its nature, though it is of lesser force from that which I held to justify the publication of the Silmarillion. All right. So, you know, I did the Silmarillion in a certain way, and now I'm going to do this as that textual history, right? Um, so... Moving forward a little bit, um, he 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 makes he makes an interesting comment a little later on in the introduction where he says many of his the pieces in this collection are elaborations of matters told more briefly or at least referred to elsewhere, and it must be said at once that much in the book will be found rewarding by re- unrewarding, unrewarding by readers of the Lord Lord of the Rings right, mm-hmm. um, who holding that the historical structure of Middle Earth is a means and not an end the mode of the narrative and not its purpose feel small desire of further exploration for its own sake, do not wish to know how the writers of the Mark of Rohan were organized and would leave the wild men of the Druidan forest firmly where they found them. Uh, my father would certainly not have thought them wrong. All right, Christopher, let's let's reach an understanding here. We want to know everything about Middle-earth, right? Like, that's just, that's who Tolkien fans are. Yeah, maybe we prefer other things, be- like certain things before other things, technical difficulties with the microphone all right uh you know yeah maybe like you know there's certain topics we prefer to hear more about first but have you met any tolkien fans we want to know everything about middle earth so i i just find this funny because i I don't know if christopher's just being very modest here or if he's really like if he was really that out of touch with tolkien fans right it's like have you met any tolkien fans dude i don't know i'm gonna play devil's advocate Go ahead. I think there are some out there that are are quite happy with things as they are. I might fall into that camp. You know that I'm like, when it gets a little too deep into the geography or this or that or the other thing, I'm kind of like, okay, can we back to the story now, please? I, I get I get that. I get that not everybody even wants to go into the Silmarillion, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but for... But but there but there's unarguably and has always been a large portion of fans, not just of Tolkien but of anything, right? The super fans who want all of the thing they love, right? They mm-hmm. want more and more, right? Oh, I'm not denying that there's not a large contingency. 
nor am I denying that people exist like me that but even you have found have enjoyed like going into more depth I have I have but you know it's honestly um it's it's not something I probably would have done on my own Mm -hmm. do you know what I'm saying yeah like once it's it's presented to me and said hey check this out and I'm like okay sure but you know, I would probably have been quite content with, you know, with rereading The Lord of the Rings, having not read The Silmarillion. Now, did my understanding of The Lord of the Rings get much more informed by The Silmarillion? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I'm really glad that I've read The Silmarillion, but mm-hmm. it's not something that I would have picked up on my own. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? So anyway, I'm just saying, don't give Christopher too hard of a time because well, I just, think there are plenty of people out there that fit that description. I'm just, I mean, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of teasing him right i know you are. um yeah i'm I, I do I'm, I'm just like that just that's just got to be modesty because he had to have known by this time just like how many rabid fans there were out there of his father's work who would who want to know anything they can about it right um yeah. and so do with that what you will i i'm just saying like the fact that there exists people who maybe are okay with just reading lord of the rings and walking away walking away from it doesn't mean that uh, there's not a lot of people that would really enjoy like everything you can throw at them, right? From well, the I legendarium, agree. I agree. There's both both uh, both parties are fairly represented, I think. Yeah, I mean that's just I think that's just I think in the last like 20 or 30 years, there's been a like huge understanding by people of like the nature of fandom and that you like there's like different levels of fans of different things. There's like they're like oh yeah, I enjoyed that book. Then there's like oh man, is there any any other books by this guy? And it's like I want to know every single thing and spend yeah. all of my time thinking about this stuff. For right? Sure. Yeah. You know, there's sure. like different tiers of of those mm-hmm. fans. Mm-hmm. So uh, there are. anyway, this is written in 1980. I'm not sure they were necessarily as well aware of that. And Christopher certainly probably wasn't. Probably there were probably not. marketing people that were aware of that, but probably Christopher wasn't. So he was like, when they were coming to him, be like, "What else you got for us?" He's like. Well, I have these old writings that my father did, which are incomplete, but surely no one wants to read those, right? And it's like the marketing people just have been like, uh, just give us what you got. We'll we'll put it we'll, we'll put it in some we'll snazzy cover art and sell it as the history of Middle Earth and put Tolkien's name on it and it'll sell a bajillion copies, right? Jillion, billion, million, gazillion. Yeah. Yep. Uh how many of you out there have got you know, people I don't know, do people go to bookstores anymore? Um, unfortunately no, but I, I remember the good old days of going to bookstores and, um, Perusing before I, you know, b- before I, I think I even read the Selma early and, and just seeing like the Tolkien section, it was like, it was, it was clearly marketed to look like other like fantasy book series where there's like, you know, 20 books in the series. Right. And you've got the history of middle earth up there. And I remember having read Lord of the Rings and I'm like, Oh man, I want to know all about the history of middle earth. So I'd like pick up the first copy and be like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> like, like it's like cool cover and the series looks really nice on the bookshelf but like what is what is this you know super academic yeah you're you just it the cover kind of seems a little a little misleading it feels <laughs> marketing it lo- feels like on the front it should say for serious tolkien nerds only right that like the, sh- the name of the well, series should... i mean i was gonna say the history of middle earth that should tip you off like the history of middle earth this is not another retelling of lord of the rings like this is like a textbook basically like the history of the united states like well, that's not a book you pick up for light reading but actually that it kind of what it is it's a it's a history of it's a textbook of the lord of the rings of the development of the history of the lord okay. of the rings that's fair so it's funny because yeah it's marketed as the history of middle earth and so you're thinking like, oh man, it's going to tell all these other stories about Middle Earth and this kind of thing, and yeah, it does that, but not in the way that you're thinking, mm. you know. Okay. Um, and it and it's more of like a, you know, a textual history of Middle gotcha. Earth, right? Okay. It's like they had in really small print. It's like the parentheses textual history of Middle <laughs> Earth, right? <laughs> it's right there on the cover. How could you be deceived? Yeah. Anyway, moving on. All right. Um, all right, so Christopher is then like, all right, so this is why I did what I did. Um, now, uh, lost my place. Sorry. I think you were going oh, yeah, to talk value. about the letter from his dad. Oh, yeah, we can go back and talk about that. And only because it's next on your notes. If you want to skip over it, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, go ahead. You got me off on a tangent, so I just completely mm-hmm. lost my place. All, all right, right, I'll read it. Okay, go ahead. This is This is from a letter. 
right? Yeah, that from March 1955. Okay. And I wish that no appendices had been promised, for I think their appearance in truncated and compressed form will satisfy nobody. Certainly not me. Clearly, from the appalling mass of letters I receive, not those people... I, letters I receive, not those people who like that kind of thing. Astonishing, astonishingly many. While those who enjoy the book as a heroic romance only and find unexplained vistas part of the literary effect will neglect the appendices very properly. I am not now at all sure that the tendency to treat the whole thing as a kind of vast game is really good. Certainly not for me, who find that kind of thing only too fatally attractive. It is, I suppose, a tribute to the curious effect that a story has when based on very elaborate and detailed workings of geography, chronology, and language that so many should clamor for sheer information or lore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well... See, so Tolkien gets where I'm coming from. Just give me a good romance and but you I, know an but, unexplained vista. But what I'm is he happy. doing? What is he doing there? He's doubting himself, right? He's doubting his own, his own muse, because his muse is to is to do all of these things, right? Yeah, but I mean, but he also recognizes that not everybody wants a deep dive. Yeah, and but I just because not fair. everybody, not everybody wants to read Lord of the Rings. True. <laughs> well, no, I think a lot of people want to read Lord of the Rings. Not everybody does. Um, well, I think there's more people out there that want to read Lord of the Rings than want to read History of Middle Earth. But my point is that there's plenty of people who, uh, for all the people who don't want to read it, there's plenty of people who do, right? Because they're forced to. No. Or just because they like... that want to, right? That like, see, there's like, there's good oh. stuff in here, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So fair enough. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm just saying like. It's interesting because Christopher guys, Christopher kind of goes into this like long thing about like, well, we didn't really think anybody would want this kind of stuff, and it's and my whole point is just that like, people, I'm, there's always going to be people who want this kind of stuff because they love Middle Earth, right? Yeah, there's going to be a market for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that's all I was trying to say. Mm-hmm. Took a long time to get there. You had to get all like question what I was trying to say, and I'm just like. I'm just trying to say I was this. just trying to say that there's also a market not for it. That's all I'm trying You're to say. You're all like, blah, blah, blah. Pretty much. And I'm all like, do 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 Yep. I'm all like, right. Just give it to me. Just spoon feed it to me. Don't make me work for it. All right. All right. Well, uh, yeah. So Christopher uh, speculates on the value of these stories, right? Um, let's see. Where did I go? I have this highlighted. Oh, but whatever view must be taken of every movie taken of this question, for some as for myself, there's a value greater than the mere uncovering of curious detail and learning that Van Tour, the Numenorian, brought his ship into Lesse, the return, into the Grey Havens on the spring winds of the 600th year of the Second Age, that the tomb of Elindil, the tall, was set by Isildur, his son, on the summit of the Beacon Hill, Halifrian, that the black rider whom the hobbit saw in the foggy darkness on the far side of the Buckleberry Ferry was... Camul, chief of the ring wraiths of Dol Guldur, or even that the childlessness of Terenin, twelfth king of twelfth king of Gondor, a fact recorded in an appendix to the Lord of the Rings, was associated with the hitherto wholly mysterious cats of Queen Baruthiel. Cats. Yes. I didn't know there were cats in Middle Earth. I think those are the only ones. Okay. Uh, the construction of this book has been difficult, and in the result is somewhat complex. The narratives are all unfinished, but to a greater or lesser degree, and in different senses of the word, and have required different treatment. I shall say something below about each one in turn and here only call attention to some general features. So anyway, um, the the value is according to the reader, right? The value, I mean, the, the value of something like this is according to the market, but when is that mm-hmm. never really true of like writing in general, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so people want to know, like people, like there are again, getting back to that question, there are people that just want to know these things. They want to know more about, about this world that they loved and if you didn't want them to know tolkien you shouldn't have made it so darn interesting right all your fault you should have been lamer that's right you should have just been like told a really lame story and then no one would have cared no one would have cared right that would make christopher's life a whole lot simpler yeah that's what what christopher is trying to say here he's like it's like if my dad hadn't written such an awesome book i wouldn't have to do all this man dang it gosh thanks a lot dad thanks a lot yeah. All right. So why these works? Why are the why are the things in here that are in here? Uh, Christopher again 
talks about this in a very kind of like, you know, the way we, you know, that kind of prose that we described before. Kind of that makes your brain hurt. Yeah, that you have to go back and read several times. But I, ba- I think basically he just says, well, because these are unfinished works. <laughs> And it's like, well, weren't there a lot more? Apparently there are a lot more because you published 12 more volumes like this. And then it's like, well, they are all narrative or descriptive and not philosophic or speculative. That's right. They tell a story. Right. Yeah. So they are tales, except for those ones that aren't tales. Like at the there end. Are some, there are some things that aren't tales. <laughs> so like at the end about the wizards and, you know, the Palantir and so, all that stuff. So I tried, you know, I really tried to understand like what Christopher is trying to say about why he chose these specific things to put in this first unfinished tales but and i just kind of landed on it's like because these are the things he wanted to put in there because <laughs> i felt like and it. he's allowed to do that he is allowed i mean to do that. he's yeah. the one like it's kind of the thing when you're in charge of something you do it the way you want to do it like who yeah. cares what anybody else thinks did you put all the time into this no okay so i'm just going to do it the way i want to do it to those who would wonder why i chose the tales that i did i will simply say this because I felt like it. <laughs> Deal with it. I, I was going to say, I, I had something more, le- a less PG go through my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. He, he may have, but gentlemen probably don't say that. English gentlemen. Well, anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, what? what? <laughs> English gentlemen, but those American gentlemen. <laughs> American gentlemen. Are, is there even such a thing? Those, okay. Well, well, we need no, uh, we need we, we need, need David Bates to weigh in on this. We do need so, David Bates to weigh yeah. in. Um, but what I was going to say is, what's the point in spending all kinds of time and emotional and mental energy on a project that you yourself and doing it a way that you yourself would not be happy with? There's no point. Yeah. And doing all of that work, like and worrying too much about what other people are going to say. There's no point to that. Yeah. Just do it the way you want to do it. Well, that's what I come back to, and and yeah. you know we we've been kind of like having having some having some fun at christopher's expense with this but like um at the end of the day like i i just always default to i'm glad i'm glad he gave us whatever he did absolutely right? and, and i don't feel like he needs to justify why he did what he did uh i don't i'm glad he did i'm glad he explained his, I'm not his saying thinking I'm not glad i'm yeah. just saying i don't think he i think it was above and beyond i don't think he needed to yeah, no i, I, I think agree. he could have just said here you go enjoy i agree with that i'm not like why did you do it this way, you big jerk? Right? That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> it's more like Trish trying to trying to understand, like, well, why didn't you do like what may have been ultimately the easier thing, and just been like, oh yeah, uh, he, he, uh, you fantasy author who want to become really famous, read this story, read read these manuscripts that my dad wrote about, you know, these characters Aldarion and Arendis, and make this a book, right? Mm-hmm. And we'll sell that book, and it'll have your, it'll have J.R.R. Tolkien on it, and then you'll have your name, like, you know, edited or something like that by, um, you know, with help from such and such or yeah. however they want to do it, and like then we'll package mashup. it as a book that Tolkien wrote, and we'll sell a bajillion copies of it, but you'll get a lot of credit for it, and you can then parlay that into your own book deal, right? Yeah, I feel like in a way that's a little like I can see why he didn't do that. I think there's respect for his dad in there, and then I think it's also a little. Not deceitful, but I think it's kind of like, I don't know. It feels a little contrived, Mm -hmm. you know? But I'm also in a different camp than you are when it comes to this, which we've already discussed. So I'm happy for them to be unfinished. I I have landed on all of this and just thinking to myself, I'm just glad that, I, I really am glad that Christopher did this. I think it's like, it's kind of like eating your vegetables first, right? And I so always that, eat my vegetables first. Yeah, but I mean, let's face it, I you're kind of you're kind of a nerd. So the rest of us eat. Wait, the rest no, of- I save them for last because they're my favorite. <laughs> I eat them first and last. And first and last, I only eat vegetables. Yes. Um, Sorry, I messed up your analogy. But but no, you didn't. Okay, it's still good. it's still the right analogy. Is it still the right yeah. analogy? Because I don't understand. Because most people most people wouldn't eat their vegetables first, right? Um, but it's it's like eating your vegetables first. And now, again, like what I said, what I said towards the beginning of this episode, now that we have all this and we can just can be complete, like the the Tolkien, the hardcore Tolkien fans can be like, whoa, wait a minute. Chapter book six of chapter three of book six, section line 27 says this and you put this in this show. Right. Mm. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we can now kind of go back and be like, you need to be true to Tolkien. And so. I like that. 
I like that right? too. I, I, like I like that because now there's a greater responsibility on on anyone who does anything going forward to be true to what Tolkien would have wanted because there's mm-hmm. plenty out there about like what what his own vision was. Yeah. Yep. Right. I think that's and true. and we even see that like Christopher set the example and that he was trying to correct the he was trying to kind of correct the record with some of the things that he did in the Silmar that he did in the Silmarillion. Yep. Right. Yep. And he does that going forward. Yep. So there you go. Unfin- that's that's the introduction to unfinished tales. So on the on the next episode, we're going to continue discussing unfinished tales and kind of look at what's in there. Right. What are the different th- things that are in there? We won't go into each one, obviously, because that would take forever, but we are going to give an overview of each part of it and, you know, say and kind of explain why is this in here and mm-hmm. where did it come from, mm-hmm. right? So maybe a little synopsis yeah. of what it's about. Exactly. Cool. That sounds good. Yep. All, All right. right. Hey, let's move on to a little correspondence. Oh, okay. So let's f- do this. first, I want to apologize that I'm delinquent in responding to so many of you. The last few weeks have been pretty busy with non-Tolkien work for me. Thanks for your understanding and patience, and please know that we appreciate every single message we get. We won't get to all of the correspondence backlog today, but we'll do our best to make a dent in it. So, that being that said. That was a nice little, um, what's that called? Disclaimer. That was you a know good disclaimer. It. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, all without right. further ado. Yeah, let me organize my screens here. Mm-hmm. Could have done that before now. I know. Okay. All right. So... First note is from David Bigwood. He says, sounds like you have a good plan for moving forward. Just noticed on Amazon, the History of Middle Earth three-volume set is only $117. Not bad for hardcovers with thousands of pages. I bet it is less expensive than the 12 paperbacks. Cheers. So. I wonder if that's still a deal. Is this a recent message? I don't. uh, Yeah, a few days ago. So. Okay. So go go check that out, y'all. Mm-hmm. Maybe get yourself a copy yourself. of the history of Middle Earth. Treat yourself. Treat yourself. It's February. We mm-hmm. all need to treat ourselves so we can survive February. Thank you, David. Mm-hmm. Thank all you. All right. Uh, the next note is from John R. Uh, John R. says, "I just received my three-volume box oh. hardcover history of Middle Earth box set. Bring it on." Woo! I like that. Yeah. Woohoo! That's what I'm talking about. That's getting me pumped up. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. Wait, are we doing History of Miller? Yes. On the podcast? The Is that our <laughs> That's oh, the plan. I thought we were doing Unfinished Tales. <laughs> well, we're doing Unfinished Tales. It is the first step on the post Silmarillion. Oh. <laughs> okay. I guess I was checked out last episode. Oh, <laughs> or maybe man. something got lost in translation. Well, um, now, now that I know our plan... I, uh, um, I'm going to make okay. you read the entire history of Middle I'm Earth sure as punishment. Are. I'm sure you are. All in one, like, you know, not re- let you read anything else until you've read it all. Okay. Thank you, John. Yes, thank you, John. Thank you for exposing Greta for the fraud that she <laughs> <is>. <laughs> Oh, man. This is not good. People are going to be like, why Why is she even on this podcast? You're, you're along for the ride. It's cool. <laughs> I don't even know what the ride is because but I'm because here. if it was just me being because let's face it I I know I was like you're the one that's blah 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 but it's really like I'm the one that's blah 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 and you're one that's like rid it to do right that's true yeah that'd be an awesome podcast if Annie Bernard was on it with us oh heck yes that would be so good the nerd dog all right uh next note is from Eric O Eric says hi John I hope that during your marathon race through the history of Middle Earth. You and Greta will take the time for Athrabeth Finrod uh, Andreth in Volume 10, Morgoth's Ring. Seems to me that Tolkien Road has been about the road of Tolkien's life and his beliefs in particular. This work near the end of his life is mind-blowing within the Legendarium, but also touches closely on his religious beliefs. It reads well on its own, and I think that you and Greta will have a great discussion on the nuances that Tolkien is weighing in this story. Eric. Yeah, thanks, Eric. So uh, we definitely like plan to do some asides and and we'll definitely be marking things on our journey is like, we need to come back to this sooner rather than later. Um, because I think there are things that are going to jump out at us like that. And I think I, I know that other people have mentioned that one to me as well as one that's definitely worthy of some focused attention. Okay. So cool. Thank you much. Yes. Thank you. All right. The next is from William S on February 8th. This is a comment on, uh, my, on my post on our website for who is Tolkien's greatest villain, the video we did. Uh, William says, Glaurung was a pretty vile character considering his final exchange with Neonor during the Children of Hurin. 
For my cash, he's probably the worst and probably the Witch King of Angmar, a.k.a. the Lord of the Nazgul, would be at the height of my lists. Hmm. Even though the Bible had over 40 authors and his collection of 73 books and spanned 1,500 years, it feels like we're debating the diciness of Judas to Cain or Pharaoh to, ha- to Haman or even the Herods. Copious amounts of respect and love and warmest wishes in Mashiach Yeshua, a.k.a. Christ Jesus. Love the hmm. show. You know, he makes an incredibly great point there. Mm-hmm. I think he's right. I like that analogy he made. Yeah. About the dice, the debating the diciness of Judas or Cain or Pharaoh or I mean, there's just tons of bad guys. Yeah. And and you know, especially in a work as expansive as Tolkien's, like there's tons of them. But that's the fun of the debate, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm thankful that Tolkien gave us so many great bad guys that this is actually an issue. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. There's a there's a great case to be made that Ungoliant is the worst. There is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and others as well. So, mm-hmm. well, thank you for your note, William. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. It's good stuff. All right. Next is from Joey S. Let's see here. Uh, Joey is weighing in, and I think he kind of agrees with you as well, Greta. I feel the point is mute. I don't think Sauron is the greatest villain to ever flow from Tolkien's pen, but he is a great character with depth stemming back to the Silmarillion. Melkor was the OG since the Ainur were created, but even then I still wouldn't label him the greatest evil. Hmm. My reasoning is there are many villains in Tolkien's works. Each has something different to contribute, and that creates diversity within the realm of evil. I love Ungoliant and the darkness she leaves behind regarding her children, but she's hardly a main antagonist. Everyone has their favorites that they connect to the end, and Amazon is just running with with what the majority of the population would know and expect. Since the films were so successful, it makes sense they would choose Sauron. He's also the main villain during Numenor's time, like you said. I agree that it's to, it's to pull in viewers and boost the show's following. I think it was a stretch to say the greatest villain Tolkien ever came up with, but I also don't blame them for trying to hype up Lord of the Rings fans. Fans of all Tolkien's works would appreciate respect for the Legendarium in, ter- in regards to Latron Prime and realize that people loved all his hard work and not just the ones that got made into big movie success stories. Just my two cents, though. Yeah. That was a good two cents. It's, that was yeah. uh, probably more like 20 cents. I was going to say, at least at least a dollar for yeah. my, my money's worth. Yeah. No, I think he makes an excellent point. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. All mm-hmm. right, moving on. Chuck F. All right. Chuck says, uh, Happy New Year. Greetings, Cars Wells. Happy New Year, and I wish you all the best in 2021. Listening to episode 224, you mentioned how it, how it just feels right to watch Lord of the Rings over the holidays. I agree, and I think it might have something to do with the fact of all the movies were on a December release schedule. I, th- oh. I think that ingrained this tradition in some of us. Not a bad tradition to uphold, especially when going through tough times, in my opinion. I really enjoy the podcast. Keep up the great work. Looking forward to more Tolkien exploration in 2021. Hmm. So. Oh, I didn't, I, didn't, I hadn't even put that together, that the movies were released yeah. in December in the theater. Mm-hmm. I just didn't even remember that. Yeah. That's a I, good good, uh, good call there, though, Chuck. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good observation mm-hmm. and uh, helps put it all together for us. So. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Mm-hmm. All right. Next note is from Monique. Monique S. Let me find it here. There we go. Monique says, hearing Lewis's review of Lord of the Rings read by Greta brought tears to my eyes. I think my husband wondered why I was sitting in the driveway with tears in my eyes as I was listening while driving. (laughs) The beauty of friendship, meaningful and insightful compliments, set me to thinking about true friendships. A print version is open on one of my tabs, and I don't want to shut it. Thank you for not only referring to it, but reading it. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. It really was a beautiful review, though. It it is, and it's so cool, yeah, to go back and hear, like, the the role he played in helping his mm-hmm. his friend, you know, rightfully become as popular as he would find the success, right? That that he yep. really we all know he deserved. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. You know, cool how friendship can play out in that way. Yeah. Thank you for your note, Monique. Yes, thank you. All right. Next up, I mean we're we're making our way through this. All right. This is good. I like this. Yeah, for sure. Fun. Um all right. This is from Dan I on uh, January 31st. Dan says, hello, I recently, uh, he says, a long expected podcast. Hello, I recently found your podcast right after Christmas 2020. I've been crushing episodes over the last month and I'm so glad I found you. I had received the Great Tales trilogy and read them over Christmas break. As a younger Tolkien fan, it is sometimes difficult to find people who share who share the affinity for Middle Earth and Arctic culture. After two years, my girlfriend finally finished watching Lord of the Rings for the first time and and enjoyed it, but I don't think she was super passionate as some of us are. Ha ha. 
It's true. <laughs> as I'm writing this, I'm listening to your episodes of Aldarion and Arendis, which mm-hmm. I recently read as I'm working through Unfinished Tales for the first time. I love the episodes discussing the movies, as well as Middle Earth and religion. I'm the president of a Christian club at school, and how Tolkien's Catholicism influenced his writing is fascinating. Hmm. I hate to ramble on, insert Led Zeppelin Gollum reference here, <laughs> absolutely, uh, but it is really exciting finding people discussing Tolkien on a deeper level rather than just The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings books and movies. Some of Tolkien's best stories are from the First and Second Ages, and it is a pity those stories do not receive more recognition. Hmm. I could go on and on for plenty of time, but thank you for the podcast. It has been the best find in my recent memory. You guys are truly brilliant. Sincerely, Dan. Oh, wow. Dan, Thanks, thank Dan. you so much. That's really awesome. Thank you for writing an awesome note. Mm-hmm. And um, it's it always is very cool whenever you know someone says something like that about us. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I get I get very kind of overly critical over our of our work here and I you know because I listen to a lot of other podcasts and I listen to others and I'm like well you know they do a good job of editing and like you know just organizing their thoughts and sometimes I like I get finished with an episode and I'm like eh, it felt I don't know it, it didn't come off exactly the way I wanted it to so but you're you, you can be your own worst critic right mm-hmm. For sure. and um so it's always awesome when somebody like comes along and says hey you guys are awesome I love what you're doing right yeah every time really we get a note like this y'all it uh it it really it really means a lot and i'm it's not just boost. saying that to like you know because people say oh that means so much to me like it really does every time i read something like this mhm it's pretty awesome it's wind in our sails absolutely. for sure for sure absolutely. and i love the mental image of crushing episodes yeah, i, I think that's that's really cool i know yeah. i i want i want all of you all crushing our episodes right yeah just crush it that's right man between crushing episodes and Bring in on the history the of the only Earth. way to I consume mean... our episodes is to crush them. Mm. That's the only acceptable way. Okay. There's no like listening in the back, like, you know, just kind of like having it on, like, blah, blah, blah. You got to be crushing, crushing these episodes. It. Crushing so. it. <laughs> Love it. Make that your New Year's resolution. That's right. If That's you right. haven't already. Thanks so much, Dan. Yes. Great thank to you, hear Dan. from you, and please keep in touch. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, John. Next one is from John. This is from John P. John says, Hi, John. I'm a newcomer to the Silmarillion, and your podcast is a great asset to understanding it. I have one comment to make in reply to something Greta mentioned in an earlier episode. While discussing Melkor, she mentioned that Melkor always seems to do things at gatherings or events. I totally agree with her. My thought on this is since Christianity is woven into Tolkien's writings, I was wondering if this is a coincidence with the New Testament and Jesus. Since Jesus chose to use festivals to make a point, like during Passover, Sukkot, Hanukkah, etc., could the underlying strategy for choosing these particular times be similar? Just a thought. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, that's a good. That's, that's an interesting question. That is really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it's certainly possible. I mean, right? his first public miracle was at a wedding. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. that surely created a stir. Yeah, just like uh, you know, was it? It, it, it. Anyway, yeah, Melkor definitely chose these like festival times, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe it's because those are the times when people have their guard down, right? <laughs> Yes, um, and there's a lot gathered in a small space, kind of a lot of bang for your buck, if you will. It, a lot, of, lot, a lot of bang for your buck, and it also affords you the opportunity to send a message, right, and mm. um, uh, mm-hmm. of greater significance. So it's not just the act, but it's there's there's kind of like symbolic power to the act too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Jesus did do a lot of things during these different um, festivals, and I think it was for the reason, like because there's people around, there's a lot more people around. Yeah, and um, and it also gives greater symbolic resonance to the to his actions right yeah. um you know greater meaning to his actions to do those things so yeah. that's a that's an excellent observation really good yeah. yeah i like that a lot thank you so much john yes thank you all right next we are on a roll johanna t johanna t she says yeehaw finally all right hey greta hey john <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait an, that's the subject that's right yeehaw finally yeehaw finally okay cool it is an epic day for me. Finally, I've heard the newest episode from you. Now I am caught up in the presence. Ha ha. Wow. Uh, caught up in the present. Ha ha. Wow. And I just needed six months. Hey, that's you. impressive considering how many episodes we have. That is very impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, some, that's some episode crushing right that there. That is. Man, yeah. we got the best listeners. Yeah, we do. We do. The, our, our listeners crush it. They do. Yeah. They are amazing. Thank you very much. I'm happy to hear that you want to read The Silmarillion. Uh this is her. I'm going back to her, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am happy to hear that you want to read the Silmarillion. Um, oh, she says, to read the Silmarillion. She says, German writing again. So I guess I guess she had trouble uh, spelling it. 
Uh, that's cute. Um, <laughs> I love it so much. It was the first Tolkien book I ever read after I listened to your series about it. It was easy to read, but maybe just because it was translated. Hmm. Now I read The Lord of the Rings, and I enjoy every page of it. I missed at the end a little bit, the haiku, so it is good that you want to read again. I'm excited to hear the newest episode, but what should I do now with my spare time? Well, it's obvious to me what you should do with your spare time. Start reading History of Middle Earth. Well, is that what you were going to say? Yes. I'll, reading Tolkien always comes first. But then if you need podcast listening, go back and listen to our podcast again. Oh, just re-listen. Yeah. Now that she's caught up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. And we'll keep putting out new episodes. And, you know, if, if it takes you six more months, then we'll probably have like... 24 more episodes out by then, new episodes. So you go back and listen, then you can have 24 episodes to binge listen to, to binge. if you're not listening to them on a regular basis. so Not a bad idea. That makes the most sense to me. Personally, I would get ahead of the game and just start reading History of Middle Earth. Well, no, I'm saying she can do both, right? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep, you're right. But you can't she listen. Could. There's no audible version of uh, the History of Middle Earth, so you can't listen to it. Uh, yeah. Mm. So well, I guess I'm out. Should I just leave now or wait till the end of the episode? Why? Because there's no audible version of History of Middle Earth. Ah, just kidding. All right. Johanna, thank you. Yes, thank Awesome you, that Johanna. you're caught up, and yep. it's great to hear from you. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I can think of nothing better to do than go back and listen to The Tolkien Road, all uh, 229 episodes, 230 episodes. So, yes. For what it's worth. For what it's worth. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up is Chris H., from January 26th. Uh, Chris says, just want to say thank you for this podcast. It is so nice to find a good Christian-based podcast that I can listen to in my car in front of small children without having to worry about uh, language and for the most part content. (laughs) For the most part part content. Uh, Even though I may have different theological and religious views than you, I'm Baptist, I enjoy the work both you and your wife do. Keep up the good work and God bless. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Yes, thank you, Great Chris. to hear from you. Absolutely. Um, I definitely can sympathize with, um, you know, there, there's actually a lot of podcasts that I'd love to be able to listen to, like on car trips with, mm-hmm. uh, especially so Greta can hear them. Uh, but yeah, I'm just not like comfortable listening to them because there's uh, just too much, too much stuff that would make it really uncomfortable with the kids in the car. Mm-hmm. Although we did listen to, um, what was the one we listened oh, to? Oh, in your backyard oh your own backyard your yeah own backyard which is a uh, really interesting true crime podcast mm-hmm. and that one gets a little dicey at times but the kids all really liked it they're getting to an age where they can kind of enjoy that and it's not like it's just foul for you know like foul for the sake of being foul right. or something like right, that right it's all so. part of the part of the story but anyway i can definitely sympathize with you and i'm glad mm-hmm. that that that's one reason that the tolkien road um kind of is a good one for you and your crew right yeah. uh that's important to us it's been important to us from the beginning um and normally in our daily lives, we just drop f bombs all the time. So you know, Shh, don't tell our secrets. I mean, it's like every other word. It's like watching it. It's like watching an episode of The Sopranos. But um, but we were like deliberately on the podcast. We're like, we want to make a non. We want to make a, non- a podcast. We want to step that's outside not like our comfort zone. Yes. For a little bit, let's pretend yeah. that we just don't talk that way. Right. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> all right, we're gonna use this podcast to make a turn in our lives. Yes. There we go. That's right. There we go. Uh, Chris, thank you so much. Yes, Great to hear from you. Please you, keep in touch. All right. Uh, we're almost there, at least for the correspond. There's still a lot of correspondence, y'all, that I haven't gotten to, but we're going to hit three more. Uh, I loved this one. Where is it? Uh, this is from Mitch M. Nope, not this one. Um, there we go. Mitch M. Uh, this is in reference to episode 226, The Life of J.R. Tolkien, part four. Uh, three minutes. COVID-19 aside, you always give prop proper respect if something is is badass enough like gaining a patron or chipping in you can give them a high five however the commensurate response to the dutch dylan style greeting is the dutch dylan style greeting from predator which is a uh, reference that flies over greta's head because i haven't done my job and made her watch predator uh but i know exactly what you're talking about and you're right that is the that is the uh no doubt like you got to do it that way so okay i'll take your word for it yeah. And I'll take Mitch's word for it. I'm just happy that he approves of our virtual high fives. I think that needs to be something we offer on uh you know, offer on our Patreon stuff is we just, we need to start doing like virtual high five, right? For How like we work that in. Just for new sign ups, right? You get you get the virtual high five. Ooh, that's I just a gotta good remember idea. to do it. Yeah. 
You know what makes the virtual high five though are the sound effects. So we really got to perfect those. Mm-hmm. I think we're pretty good at it. You think? I think you're better than I am. But I need to practice. Mitch, I know exactly what you're talking about, and 100 percent agree with you. If we could do the uh, if we could do the virtual Dutch Dylan greeting, then uh, we totally would. Is there a reason so, we can't? Well, it involves the actual grasp. So here, like for those of you watching on video, you can see you can see me doing it, right? So it's like this. And and then you got to say, then I'd have to say, Greta. You son of a bleep, right? Oh. And then we, and it's like we grasp hands as I'm saying that, right? And then okay. we like try to arm wrestle, like in midair, right? Oh. Right. And do I say anything? Uh. Wait, who are you? Are you Dutch or Dylan? Uh, I I would definitely, I don't know. They're both really cool. One's Arnold Schwarzenegger, and one's um, I think it's Carl Weathers. Um. Okay. And uh, you look more like Arnold Schwarzenegger, so I would probably be Carl Weathers. <laughs> yeah. You have more muscles than I do. <laughs> okay. okay. So anyway, who initiates? Good Schwarzenegger voice there. <laughs> who initiates the greeting? It's um, it, it's initiated by, uh, let's see what you just got to go and watch the scene. We we got to watch Predator. <laughs> okay. It's initiated by Dutch, uh, because Dylan calls out from another room, like kind of says something snarky when Dutch doesn't know he's there, and then Dutch sees him and he goes. Dylan, and they walk towards each other, and he's mm-hmm. like, "You son of a," and they like grasp hands as he says the uh, word that I won't say. Okay. And and then they start arm wrestling in midair, and oh. it's like it's like zoomed in, like their biceps just like bulging <laughs> as they arm wrestle in midair. It's amazing. <laughs> it's so good. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll have to watch Predator, so I can really get the full effect of Mitch's email. Mitch would approve. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Mitch. Yes. Great thank hearing you. from you. All right. Uh, Last uh, couple more notes, one from Jennifer from January 22nd, uh, and this is on paperbacks. Aww. Paperbacks have more mistakes in them. I like paperbacks when they are not the mass market editions. I would agree with that. I'm not a big fan of the mass market paperbacks. No, me neither. Uh, I, in fact, a lot of my history of Middle Earth is in the mass market paperbacks, oh. but I'm trying to get them in the non-mass market paperbacks. Some paperback editions are better than others, just as some hardcover editions are better than others. My Ballantine Book Club edition of The Hobbit literally split in half. Mm. I prefer the good hardcover editions because they last longer, especially when the binding and the pages are sewed and not glued. Give me a paperback with sewed pages. Yeah. Yeah, I remember talking about this on the episode. I I like the way hardbacks look. Mm -hmm. I just think paperbacks are more convenient. Yeah. I do not like reading a hardback in bed. And I also hate traveling with hardbacks because they're really heavy. Yeah, most definitely. But I I, I totally get it. Yeah, I understand where Jennifer's coming from. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a good point, and we all, uh, I definitely would agree with the not being a fan of mass market paperbacks, but liking other styles. I, I actually would prefer, like, the nice, the hardier paperback uh, mm-hmm. kind of version. Same. Same. Um, but when you really love something, you want it in hardcover. Mm-hmm. It's like the vinyl version of, uh, you know, an album you love, right? That's true. So. Yes, indeed. Yep. Thanks, Jennifer. Yes, thank you. And last, but of course not least, is Marilyn the Librarian. Marilyn. Uh Marilyn uh, is responding to one of our episodes on the life of Tolkien, and uh, the subject line is, Who is the author? Hello, Carswells. Firstly, greetings to all my fellow librarians who are part of the TRP community. I wasn't sure what that meant. So... No, it's uh, David uh, Bigwood. Well, I know, a librarian. I, I know that, but I'm not sure what TRP community is. Tolkien Road Podcast. Oh, you're, you're kidding, right? <laughs> like, you're. Sorry. You've got to I be thought, kidding. I thought that was some librarian thing. Guys, sorry. Who's the fraud now? <laughs> Just asking for a friend. I swear, this is what she does all the time, right? <laughs> I'm like, anyway, sorry, Marilyn. I apologize for my <laughs> husband's. I've never heard anybody refer to it as the TRP community, but I like that. I like it too. Tolkien Road Podcast. That's what we are. Yeah. We are a community, and the name of our podcast is Tolkien Road Podcast, which is a podcast. So, it is a pod. It's a podcast. Yeah. So that's why it's TRP. Right. Got it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now that I've set him straight, you may. Re- now that we know that it's a podcast, you may. <laughs> and now that we, now that you know what TRP is. All right. Moving along with Marilyn's note, it's lovely to hear from a colleague. She says, referring mm-hmm. to a fellow librarian. Yes. On the topic of authors and their biographies, I know from firsthand experience that biographical knowledge of authors enhances my experience and understanding of their writings. It seems to me that the best authors, creators, take their flaws and their sufferings and transform them into wisdom grounded in experience. 
At the same time, who would want their shortcomings and embarrassments exposed to the world, not to mention their private lives? Both Tolkien and Lewis lived and worked when Freud was first becoming widely known, and they were not impressed with his theories. I think that contributed to their strong resistance to and criticism of what Lewis called the personal heresy, the idea that an author is reflected in their work. He applied that term primarily to poetry, but both he and Tolkien made it clear that they saw no need to know more about the author in order to understand or enjoy a work of said author's creation. With every due respect, I disagree. For me, in addition to greater understanding of the legendarium, it gives me hope to know that someone is so wounded, struggling with things I struggle with, could come up with an idea such as eucatastrophe. Eucatastrophe. Mm. What a gift. Mm-hmm. I'd also like to say that Wind in the Willows contains the best description of awe in the presence of the sacred that I've ever read. As they approach the nature god Pan, Mole turns to Rat. Rat! He found breath to whisper, shaking. Are you afraid? Afraid, murmured the rat, his eyes shining with unutterable love. Afraid? Of him? Oh, never, never. And yet, and yet, oh, Mole, I am afraid. Truly a vision of the numinous. Mm. Thanks for reminding me of it. Yeah. Incredible vision of the numinous, right? Mm. Um, that, that was, I remember that was like, that 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 scene in Winter of the Willows was just like a turning point in my understanding of like uh what what it would be like to experience the supernatural in like a um in a way that's undo- like undoubtedly like mm-hmm. oh my gosh I'm experiencing the supernatural right. like even like yeah. in a positive way mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. um you know so um it, even like I can sympathize with that just in like some of the things we saw like our out west trip and like a natural level right and just but just like oh my gosh seeing this thing is amazing yeah. like I'm I love it, and I want to know, and I want to jump into it, and I'm terrified of it, right? You yeah. know, it's like... Yeah, or even when we lived out in Washington, yeah. some of the places we saw yeah. out there. Yeah, same thing. Um, so that's a great point, Marilyn. But to uh, go back to before, I think we are completely on the same page with you as far as the what Lewis called the personal heresy. And mm-hmm. it's inter- it really is, I, I think... Um, I, can remember, I, I think somebody else pointed that, that same thing out where it's like um, Freud... Had um, and it may have been concurrently um, with Marilyn sending this in, but that Freud was very popular at the time, and so I can definitely understand why Tolkien and Lewis might have like reacted negatively to this idea that like you need to know an author's work, and I don't think you have to you have to know it to to appreciate a work necessarily, but I but like religion, I think it enhances your appreciate like like it knowing informs. about Tolkien's religion, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. It enhances and it informs mm-hmm. your understanding of something, right? Mm-hmm. So you can appreciate it that much on that much greater a level Mm -hmm. just like diving into any other aspect of it allows you to appreciate it more absolutely right yeah uh you know fortunately with tolkien like getting to know him in general not that he was perfect person but in general like you you really do like love him even more as you get to know him more on a personal level right Mm -hmm. um and you know that's that's really cool so um i i totally sympathize with where Lewis and Tolkien were and not wanting to just like let it, you know, kind of give way to F- Freudian readings of everything because then they're like famous authors and like, well, now everybody's going to be trying to read my stuff. Like it's some kind of weird Freudian thing. And, um, and that's annoying, right? Just yeah. as annoying as all the other, you know, fallacies that we've talked about that people try to do with Tolkien's works. And, but at the same time going into those things, as Marilyn says, can help you gain a better appreciation for them. So word. Good stuff from Maryland as always. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And that will wrap it up for correspondence this time. I still, I still got a lot in the in the mailbag, y'all. So uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get to it over the next several episodes. Um, and we appreciate it all. We do. Yeah, yeah. Love to hear from you. Tolkien Road Podcast at Gmail dot com, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and through the website. Yep. On the next episode, we'll be taking a high level look at the contents of Unfinished Tales. So, con- continuing our look at Unfinished Tales. Sounds good. All right. Mm. Shout out to our patrons, especially the following. Caitlin of T with Tolkien. Lise U. Andrew T. John R. Shannon S. Brian O. Emilio P. Zeke F. James A. James L. Chris L. Chuck F. Ozzy V. Ish of the Hammer. Teresa C. David of Pints with Jack. Jonathan D. Eric S. Joey S. Eric B. Matt L. Johanna T. Ms. Anonymous. Sam N. Mike M. Thank you, guys. Thank you all so much, as yes. well as those celebrating their patron anniversary in February. Aja V. Chuck F. Eric B. Ish of the Hammer. John R. Magnus V. Cat L. David Bigwood. And Sarah M. You guys are the best. Thanks, y'all. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye.